Good morning, St. Mark's. We are so glad that you are here with us this morning. My name is Jessica Flake, and I'm on the spiritual formation team. We have some fun things coming up that we want you to know about. Our first thing is coming up that is on this Thursday is our golf, Guys Golf Fellowship. This Thursday from 5.30 to 9, out at the I-85 Golf. Um, it's gonna be a fun night full of local barbecue from Steve's Smokehouse. I don't know if you've had it yet, but it's amazing. Um, also, a simulator driving range similar to Top Golf if you've ever done that before. Um, so this is gonna be a fun night for you guys. If you haven't registered yet, you can do that on our website. Um, if you don't feel like you can get there at 5.30, don't worry about that. You can come um, as you can. The dinner's gonna be first, so um, don't feel like you have to be rushed. Um, and for us ladies, we have a few tickets left for our Lisa Turkhurst. This ticket gets you into our coffee and conversation here at St. Mark's at 1.30. This is gonna be on November 18th, Saturday, November 18th. Um, but not only does it get us into um, the event here, but it also gets us into the general admission for her tour at Williams High School Auditorium that evening. It's gonna be an amazing night full of, fill, uh, full of worship and fellowship with um, other ladies all around the, the community. Um, and you can get in more information about both of these events and you can register online at smc.church. If you are new here, we would love to get to know you. You can um, fill out the welcome guest um, ticket on the back of your pew and take it out to our welcome desk. You can talk with me or any of our wonderful welcome hosts. And we would love to get to know you and maybe grab coffee sometime in the middle of the week. Um, now I'm gonna invite you to stand up with me and um, just let go of whatever has been going on in the past week. Maybe you need to take a few breaths and, and get ready to go into worship and start to feel the, the connection with the song in our soul. And raise your hands as, you're, as you feel led to and just worship our amazing God.
resonates differently. It's hard to sit here today and not recognize the pain and the hurt of the brokenness of God's creation. We see war that continues to rage in Ukraine, seemingly with no end in sight. Conflict that is escalating in Armenia and Azerbaijan militaristic coups in the African nation of Niger. And of course, this past week, the deplorable acts of terrorism committed by the Hamas and the war and the violence that has ensued in Gaza and Israel. And it's in moments like this that, that I find myself at a loss for words. I don't have answers or solutions. Only a desperate cry of need to my God. An invitation to our God to intervene in powerful ways. There are so many layers of pain, hurt, oppression, terrorism, violence, and war, that I find myself in a posture of surrender that cries out, God, intercede. God, bring healing where there is hatred. God, bring peace in the midst of division. And so I want to take a moment today 
to pray together a prayer of humility and surrender that calls upon the sovereignty of our God to restore his broken creation. But I hope that this is not a prayer that ends in this moment, but instead is a prayer that is on our lips in the moments, the hours, the days, and the weeks that follow. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before you with heavy hearts. Lord, having witnessed horrific acts of terrorism and painful violence of war, we find ourselves speechless with only the words, Lord, we need you on our lips. And so, Lord, we pray that today you would respond to the voices of your children that cry for your intercession amidst the brokenness and the pain of your creation. A creation crying out for a Savior, but a creation so quick to deny him. And so, Lord, we pray that you would replace our hurting with healing. Lord, that you would replace hatred with peace, injustice with your just mercy. Lord, we pray boldly today for your intercession specifically in Gaza and Israel. We pray that you would step in with a divine de-escalation. Lord, one that can only be pointed to a Savior. A Savior who is intimately aware with these holy lands and the conflict that has been waged there for decades, if not centuries. Lord, may your sovereignty be made known. pray specifically today for Israelis and Palestinians who have lost loved ones. Thousands who have seen their children, their friends, their neighbors, and their siblings torn from them through senseless acts of terrorism and violence. Lord, be their comfort in the midst of pain. We pray for the tens of thousands that have lost their homes, that have seen their communities reduced to rubble. Lord, we pray that you would be their refuge and their stronghold in times of trouble. And Lord, we pray for the millions across your creation, across this globe that have had their sense of security and safety ripped from them. Lord, we pray that your peace and your hope would reign in their hearts. And so Lord, in the midst of this pain, in the midst of this brokenness, With one voice, we continually cry out, Lord, we need you. We need more of you.
Well, good morning and welcome to St. Mark's Community Church. Uh, my name is Pete Stearns and I'm one of our pastors here and, and I'm looking forward to uh, embarking on a new series with you all today. A series called The Evolution of Peter in which we are going to be exploring the life and, and more importantly the faith of, of one of Jesus' early disciples. I think oftentimes we in the evangelical church have elevated Peter to this sainthood. We've placed him on a throne. We've looked at him as the exemplar of what our faith should look like. But the reality is, in doing so, we have separated his story from our own. And we find it remarkably hard to relate with his journey of following after Christ. And so over the course of this series, we're going to attempt to humanize Peter a little bit. We're going to be looking at, yes, the good of his story, but also the bad and the ugly. Because if I'm honest, it's in those spaces that I see myself more often than not. And as we look at his story, we're going to begin to ask ourselves, how can I learn from Peter's journey in my own journey in following after Jesus Christ? Well, in 1993, the movie Rookie of the Year inspired uh, the dreams and the aspirations of, of children across the United States of America. Now, if you're not familiar, it's a story about a little 12-year-old boy named Henry that desperately wants to be a professional baseball player. But there's one problem. He's terrible at baseball. Until the very last day of school, he slips and he falls and he breaks his shoulder. And, and he finds out that, that his summer is going to be ruined because he's placed in this plaster cast that covers his entire arm and, and locks it into this position for three months. He won't get to go to the pool. He won't get to go to the beach. And, and, and most discouragingly, he won't be able to play baseball with his friends. But at the end of the summer, when he goes to get the cast off, he discovers a miracle. Upon removing the cast, the doctor recognizes that the tendons in his shoulder have healed so remarkably, so, so, with so much strength and tension, that this little 12-year-old boy can throw a baseball now at well over 100 miles per hour. Now I should pause here for a moment. Uh, just to clarify, this is a fictional story. Okay, any of us who have ever had a cast removed or, 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 or gotten out of a boot have looked at that limb and thought to ourselves, what happened to my leg and where did this shriveled up zombie limb come from? But not in this story. In this story, the cast led to this incredible healing that gave Henry the capacity to play baseball like he had never played before. And sure enough, he begins tearing it up at Little League. His catcher has to wear, uh, you know, these different pillows in front of him to keep him uh, from sustaining any injuries uh, from this flame-throwing little kid. Well, sure enough, he catches the attention of, of his hometown team, his favorite Chicago Cubs. And in a matter of weeks, he is pitching not against other 12-year-olds, but in Wrigley Stadium for the Cubs' playoff run. You see, as little kids, we dream of one day becoming a professional athlete or, or, or perhaps a, a pop sensation, maybe a Hollywood star or in today's day and age, a YouTube influencer. And we spend a lot of our time daydreaming in the backyard or standing in front of the mirror in our bathroom about what it's going to look like one day when we do indeed become a professional. Right? There's no sense of doubt in our mind. We're 100% confident that it's just a matter of time and practice before I go on and sign the contract that pays me millions upon millions upon millions of dollars. And it's easy to, to think about this and think about our own childhood and, and, and smile and, and laugh a little bit. But, but the reality is, is, is parents are probably no better. They look at their kids and, and they think to themselves, surely they're going to become professional athletes, uh, talented singers, Hollywood actors. And, and so we as parents pour all of our time into our kids. 
We pour our resources into our children to cultivate a gift in them that will one day allow them to be a superstar. In fact, I I read a study just this past week that said that 40% of parents believe that their children will one day become pros. 40% of parents believe that little Johnny is going to go on and play in the NFL. Well, the statistics are a little bit more sobering. I I found some statistics this week that were specific to uh, high school varsity athletes and their odds of going on to playing in the pro. It's already hard enough to become a high school varsity athlete. So these are already the best of the best. And here's what the statistics say. Of high school varsity baseball players, one in every 610 of them will be drafted. That doesn't mean they're going to go on and play in the big leagues. One in every 610 will even be drafted. That is 0.16%. Remember, 40% of parents believe that their kids will go on to play pro, and 0.16% of high school varsity baseball players will. But it gets worse. One in every 3,960 high school varsity football players will get picked by an NFL team. That's 0.02%. One in 10,399 will get picked by an NBA team, 0.009% of high school varsity basketball players will go on to play in the pros. But the most exclusive, one in every 12,873, 0.007% will be chosen to go on and play in the WNBA. The reality is, is that even though as children we dream of this, our dreams are incredibly unlikely. It is more likely that your child will be struck by lightning than it is that they will go on and play professional sports. Let that sink in for a moment. Well, it's probably not surprising, but in ancient Jewish culture, there were no professional athletes There were no Hollywood stars, and there certainly were not YouTube influencers. Instead, the superstars of that day, the influencers of that day, were the teachers, the rabbis, and their disciples. And and, and much like we see in, in our own youth sports environment, families spent hours upon hours dedicating themselves to resourcing their children to be able to one day become a disciple. Kids would study each and every day. They would pour themselves into their learnings. They would sit under the teachings of of, of rabbis and teachers at their local synagogues, hoping that one day they might be able to reach the level of these rabbis. But just like today, the chances of that happening were remarkably slim. As kindergartners, they would memorize the entire Torah, of their scripture, to heart, this many pages, to heart, and yet many of those kids wouldn't even go on to be qualified to be a disciple or a rabbi. Instead, over time, they would be weeded out until only the best of the best of the best of the best of the best remained. That point zero zero seven percent were invited to become a disciple to follow after a rabbi. The rest, the vast majority, would be told to go and follow after the trade of their father. A humble job like being a fisherman. And so with this context, with this understanding of the significance of becoming a disciple, I want to read about the invitation that Peter and his brother received from a teacher and a rabbi in their region. It comes to us in Matthew chapter 4. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers. Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake for they were fishermen. They were not the best of the best of the best of the best. They did not cut it. They were following after the trade of their father. And he said, come follow me, and I will send you out to fish for people. And at once they left their nets 
and followed him. You see, I said that oftentimes in the evangelical church, we elevate Peter. And in doing so, we look at this story and and we ask ourselves, are you willing to drop everything to follow after Jesus? Are you willing to give up your job, your livelihood, your community, your family to follow after Jesus? And, And I think it's a really important question to ask. But it's certainly not the question that Peter is answering in dropping his nets in this passage. Not yet, at least. We're going to see a Peter years down the road that's willing to give up everything to follow after his rabbi. But in this moment, Peter is is not living out sacrificial faith. He's winning the lottery. He's dropping everything to follow after his dreams, the things that he has always wanted for himself. This is a real life rookie of the year story. Peter has not cut it. He has no right to be a disciple. He has demonstrated that he is but a fisherman. And yet a rabbi, a teacher walking along the shore sees him and plucks him out from obscurity and invites him to fulfill his dream of being a disciple, of being significant, of being someone that his parents look at and say, I'm proud of you. And so, of course, Peter drops his nets. Wouldn't you? Those nets will be there for him if if it fails. In fact, after Jesus dies on the cross, what do we see is the first thing that Peter does? He goes back to fish. You see, each and every one of us, if presented an opportunity to seize our dreams, would take it no matter the cost. But you see, when Peter chooses to follow Jesus, he does so because of what Jesus does for him. His faith is not radical, it's not enduring, it's not reckless, it's convenient. And I think it's important to recognize Peter's faith as convenient because I think more often than not, that's the kind of faith journey I find myself walking in. One of the things that we're going to see in our study of Peter over the next three weeks is is that following Jesus isn't necessarily a linear, linear trajectory. It's not we take this one baby step and this next step and this next step and this next step. It's not a matter of flipping uh, the lights on and suddenly having a life transformed. Instead, it's fluid. And we're going to find ourselves in seasons of life where we are radically committed to the gospel message. And then we're going to find ourselves having days where our faith is merely convenient. It's beneficial. And it's dependent upon our lives, our stories, and our experience. And I hope that this passage and and this study is encouraging to us because in the midst of this, we recognize that God can redeem even a faith that is convenient, even a faith that is as small as a mustard seed. So we're going to look at two stories in in scripture today uh, in the gospel of Matthew. Each of these stories is about Peter and it's going, things are good. Convenient faith lifts our hands in worship when when our lives are comfortable. Convenient faith gives radically, studies scripture wholeheartedly, prays fervently when the return on that investment is tangible. But the moment that convenient faith becomes inconvenient, it begins to waver and falter and potentially fail. The moment our invitation to follow Jesus no longer aligns with the dreams and the hopes and the expectations we had for our life, we will find that our convenient faith no longer points to a Savior whose kingdom is bigger than ours. And I think these two stories are going to give us an apt description of what that faith looks like. So let's go ahead and we're going to skip ahead about 10 chapters here into Matthew chapter 14. 
We're going to look at this story that we've heard over and over and over again. Jesus has just fed the 5,000. And and upon feeding these 5,000, he's dismissing the crowds. and, And after they're dismissed, he just is going to take a moment by himself to pray. And so he sends his disciples off. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side. While he dismissed the crowd. After he dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone. And the boat was already a considerable distance from land. Now note this, buffeted by the waves because the wind was already against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. Then the disciples saw him walking on the lake. They were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage. It is I, don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came toward Jesus. Now again, A lot of us have read this story through the lens of St. Peter. And we've asked ourselves questions like, do I have the faith and the courage to sin? I wonder if it isn't a little bit more nuanced here. Because when I read this passage, I can't help but ask the question, why did Peter get out of the boat? Was Jesus in trouble? Did he need somebody to to step out onto the water to help guide him through the darkness to find the boat? Had one of the disciples gone overboard and and Peter was was stepping out to save them? Had, Had Jesus called to him to come out on the boat to experience this power? And the reality is, at first, the answer is no. It's Peter That says, Jesus, if it's you, call out to me and I will come. And Jesus obliges his request. And we don't know Peter's intentions, but I can't help but wonder if Peter gets out of the boat because he sees his rabbi, his teacher, doing something extraordinary. And he wants to experience a little bit of that power. I mean, I'll be honest, every single time I go to the pool, I kind of put my foot out on the water and think, maybe this time, (laughs) right? That would be pretty remarkable. That would be a pretty powerful and transformative moment. You see, Peter steps out on that water because he desperately wants to experience the power of his rabbi. And Jesus, in his mercy, obliges and invites him out onto the water. And here's what I want us to recognize. Convenient faith oftentimes needs to personally experience power in order to trust our God. We need a personal experience of God's movement in our life to trust that he is who he really says he is. To trust that that he is really deserving of my discipleship. But you see, the problem is, convenient faith then is dependent upon my experience, my way, my will, my desires, my power. It's not rooted in Christ. And you see, when our convenient faith is dependent upon our experience of the power of God, The moment we become disinterested in that power is the moment our faith begins to fail. But when he, Peter, saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Why was Peter afraid? The storm was present, we know from the scripture, before he ever got out of the boat. The water was swirling before he ever stepped foot on it. 
I don't know about you, but anytime I do something that requires a certain amount of courage, it's always the first step that's the most anxiety producing. And the moment we take that step off the high dive, the moment we take that step and, 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 and jump into the depths below, we find ourselves building our confidence. Peter should be growing in his courage, not seeing it diminished. But I wonder if what's being demonstrated in this gospel is a recognition that Peter, upon seeing the power of God, was willing to step out because he wanted to experience it. But at some point in his walk along the water, he got distracted by the waves and the wind that were always there in the first place. And in seeing the wind in the waves, he became less interested and less engaged with the power of God. And he started to sink and he cried out, save me, as if it was Jesus' power that was failing and not his faith. Shortly after I graduated college, I, uh, I was having a, a little sense of, of being lost post a, a season of being a, a, a student athlete. And, and so right at that same time, there was a representative from uh, Team World Vision, a charity running team that had come to our church, and they were sharing with us uh, about the World Vision Marathon for Clean Water. They were going to be putting together a team to run the Chicago Marathon, and this person up on stage who had probably run, uh, you know, 25 marathons in their life, had run 100 mile races had the audacity to say, look at me. If I can do it, you can too. I don't know about you, but I was looking at them thinking, well, they seem to be an elite athlete. Uh, so it makes sense that they would be able to do this. But needless to say, uh, in my delusion, I decided this is what I need. This is what's going to give me purpose. I'm going to be able to check this off the bucket list. And so I excitedly signed up. I went to the team gathering after the worship service. And, and, and I got to put on that cool orange jersey. And they had great refreshments and snacks. And they talked to us about our running groups. And, and I felt like I was a part of this cool movement, not only to accomplish something that was difficult to accomplish, but also uh, to, to leverage that as an opportunity uh, to bring care to those that were in need around the world. And so I started training and running and preparing. And sure enough, over time, I lengthened the amount I had ever run before by miles and miles and miles until race day. I woke up at the crack of dawn. I joined together with this giant crew of, of, of orange-wearing uh, runners down here in front of the Chicago skyline. Uh, there was music that was blaring in our tent. Uh, they had DJs that were pumping us up. They even had brought in professional runners uh, so that we could feel like we were also professional runners. And, and they were giving high fives and, and, and wearing jerseys with our names on them instead of the other way around. And we stood at the starting line of that marathon with 40,000 other people. And I will tell you that the excitement and the energy was tangible. You could taste it. And, and, and when the race started, we began running with this great crowd of people cheered on by, by rows of fans that wanted to see us succeed. And sure enough, 26.2 miles later, I checked something off my bucket list. But here's the thing. Thousands of others didn't finish the race. Thousands of others started, but somewhere along the journey, lost their tangible sense of the energy and excitement, lost the drive that had brought them to the starting line and decided, you know what? I'm just gonna slip off here. I've, I've gone far enough. But even more than the thousands that, that quit in the middle of the race, there are tens of thousands more that, that never even got to the starting line. That had one point thought to themselves, I'm going to do this, but for whatever reason gave up. And I can attest to that story because just a few years later, I heard the same invitation to run that marathon and I felt the same energy and I signed up and, and I was intent on running another marathon better than the last that I had run, but but somewhere along the way in the training, I lost my interest in it. I lost my engagement. And without ever making a, a, a specific decision not to run the marathon, I gave up. And you see, I think that that's true for so many of our faith stories. 
We experience in this convenient faith kind of way the power of God firsthand in our life. I can attest that I firsthand was was smacked on the head by God's power in a way that turned around my life. And, and, And my experience of that power became central to my story. But the further and further away from that moment, that experience I got, the easier it became to be distracted by by the everyday winds and waves of the world. And over time, we become less and less engaged with that faith experience that we have. And we cry out and say, God, where are you? Where are you? Because my faith is dependent on my ability to experience the power of God in my life. When I become disinterested and distracted and disengaged, suddenly I can't see the God that stands directly before me on the water. You see, I love how this story concludes. In many ways, it's, it's a footnote in, in, in what we have studied, but, but there's some power here. As Peter is sinking... He cries out, Lord, save me. And immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You have little faith, he said. Why did you doubt? I want to pause for a moment here. Because I think there's an important truth to be heard in this. Peter is living a convenient faith. A faith that's beneficial to him. A faith that's centered around his experience of God's power. And a faith that begins to crumble when he gets distracted and yet still God is faithful to him. Still Jesus does not allow him to sink in the storm. Still Jesus meets him in this selfish story and lifts him out of the water. And Jesus will do the same for us. We will find ourselves in seasons of convenient faith in which we have made Our story of following Jesus about one thing and one thing alone. Our interests, our ways, our future. And even in that, Jesus takes us by our hand and lifts us from the seas of life. But the story continues. It says, and when they, Peter and Jesus, climbed into the boat, the wind died down. And then those who were in the boat, not Peter and Jesus, worshipped him, saying, truly you are the Son of God. I love the comparison that this gospel is going to show us here. It's a comparison that we so often skip over because we're fixated upon the remarkable story of Peter, the power of walking on the water. But at the end of the story, the redemptive verse is about the 11 that didn't get out. That recognized the power of God on the water and without having to experience it, worshiped God. You see, enduring faith is in awe of God's power without having to experience it firsthand. Because now their experience of God's power is not central to their journey. Instead, their recognition of God's power is. I think we do ourselves a disservice when we only share testimonies about God and his power confronting us in powerful ways that completely reverse the trajectory of our lives, that change us 180 degrees to follow after this God that grabbed a hold of me. Those stories are powerful. That's a story that that, that I find uh, unique to my own life. But if we only tell those stories, we miss out on the stories of those that have an enduring faith. The stories of those that are not central to the experience of God's power in their life. I can't tell you how many people sit with me as we prepare for baptism and I ask them to share their testimony and they say, I don't really have one. And I say, can you explain that a little bit more? And they say, well, I've just always followed God. I always love Jesus. And what a shame it is 
that those people believe that that means they don't have a story. When in reality, they have a story of enduring faith. A story of faith that is rooted not in their own experience, but instead in their recognition of the power of God in their life. And I think that's a challenge for us, is yes, to be grateful that God meets us in our convenient faith, that God meets us in in our desire to experience his power, that he obliges our requests in his mercy, but also that he highlights the story of the 11 other disciples that didn't have to get out of the boat in order to recognize that Jesus was God. You see, the story is going to continue here in, in just a few days. And Peter is going to have a chance to redeem himself. I imagine him sitting in that boat as the rest praised God and worshiped him, sulking a little bit. He's just been slapped on the hands. He's been scolded. He's been reprimanded. And, and, and I'm sure he's, he's, he's feeling this kind of tension in him where he's experienced this remarkable high, but also now this low. But Jesus is going to give him another chance, another chance to claim a faith that moves beyond convenience. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked. Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. This is the powerful moment of Peter's redemption. A powerful moment where he stands out from the rest in recognizing that Jesus is the Son of God, that Jesus is in fact the prophesied Messiah. He doesn't totally understand what that means, and we're going to get to that in a minute, but there's this powerful moment where he's standing in this place of significance, and he looks at his rabbi and he says, you're so much more than a teacher. You're the Messiah that we have been waiting for. I had a chance to be in Caesarea Philippi a couple of years ago. And it's this really fascinating place because it was a place that held uh, a great spiritual significance for the Roman Empire. Uh, it was a place where, where um, Herod had built all sorts of temples to the Roman gods. In particular, in Caesarea Philippi, there was a temple to the god Pan. And the temple to the god Pan was surrounded by these beautiful waterfalls, these man-made waterfalls. I think we have an image of it. They had these gardens that were carved out of this bedrock. It was this complete solid stone that undergirded this whole thing. And behind the gardens, the stream emanated from this massive cave in the cliff. And it came pouring down there. And it's here that scholars believe that Jesus is having this engagement with Peter. But here's the interesting thing. That cave there used to have a facade of the temple of Pan in front of it. Pan was in the Roman mythology the gatekeeper of hell. And it was believed then that that hole represented the gates of of hell within the Roman Empire. And so right here, in front of the gates of hell, Peter looks at Jesus and says, you are the Messiah. Right there, standing upon that bedrock, that foundation, he looks at Jesus and says, you are the Son of God. And with this context, looking at the same background that the disciples had, listen to Jesus' response. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, Peter, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not overcome it. Think about the power of what's happening in that moment. You see, because Jesus recognizes that Peter claims that he is the Messiah, but he also recognizes that Peter's understanding of who the Messiah is is not aligned with Christ's intentions and his kingdom. You see, Peter is a Jew. 
He's experienced the oppression of the occupation of the Roman Empire. He believes that the Savior will come to overthrow the powers of this world, to reestablish the nation of Israel. And in this, he looks at Jesus and says, you are the one that's going to fulfill my dreams. You are the one that's going to fulfill my future. And Jesus looks at that faith. And he recognizes it as as the faith of a mustard seed. He recognizes it as paling in comparison to the intentions that he has for this world. And yet he still looks at Peter and says, upon your shoulders and the shoulders of others like you that have just this small iota of faith, I will build my church. And even the gates of hell Even the powers of the gods of Rome will not overcome a church built of a group of people that were not the best of the best of the best of the best. Built upon the shoulders of a group of people that that have the faith of a mustard seed. And yet I'm so powerful that there is no kingdom that will overcome me. There is no kingdom that will stand against you. It's even more powerful when you consider the very next encounter, a mere sentences later, what happens between Jesus and his disciples. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed And on the third day, be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said. This shall never happen to you. And Jesus turned and said to Peter, standing in front of the gates of hell, to the man he just said, upon your shoulders I will build a church, and even the gates of hell won't overcome. Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Let that sink in. That Jesus has claimed that even in this faith of a mustard seed faith, even in this convenient faith, the powers of hell will not overcome, but still, he calls Peter out. Because Peter, in his pursuit of Jesus, has placed his future in front of the intentions of God. Convenient faith fails when our expectations of the future depart from God's kingdom and God's will for our life. Peter is standing there with full expectation that Jesus is about to overthrow Herod. He's about to overthrow Caesar. He's about to throw over the Roman occupation of Israel. And Jesus, in the next breath, says, I'm about to go and die. And Peter takes him aside. He doesn't call him out in front of the crowd. And and he, and he begins to argue with him, to wrestle with him. Jesus, it doesn't have to be that way. Couldn't you do it some other way? Can't you do it in a way that still maintains the goals and the dreams and the hopes that I have for my life? And in that, I suddenly see myself. How often do we find ourselves debating with Jesus when his invitation to follow him leads us into a space that is uncomfortable? Jesus, I'm willing to follow you with all my life. I'm willing to surrender to you all that I have, unless, of course, that leads me to an uncomfortable worldview or ideology, unless that that pushes back against how I see the world, unless my Christian community nudges me to take a step, in which case I'll find another church. I'll find another group of friends that can affirm the way that I think and want to love. Jesus, I want to follow you radically with my generosity and my time and and in my resources, but but only after I'm financially secure, Jesus. Then think about how generous I can be. We justify it. 
Jesus, I'm going to care for that stranger in the road. I'm going to be a good Samaritan, but today is pretty busy. Today isn't going to work. And so maybe uh, we can schedule something next week where I can follow you, where I can respond to your image and your creation before me. And you see, in that space, Jesus rebukes Peter. In that space, Jesus rebukes us because the problem with a convenient faith is that it centers around our schedule. It centers around our goals. It centers around our retirement plan. It centers around our future. And so every time God calls us to take a step out of our kingdom and into his, we resist. We push back. We argue. We say, couldn't you do it in a different way? And in doing so, we miss out on the fullness of the life that God is calling us to, the kingdom that he is building here among his children. Jesus, after rebuking Peter, turns to the disciples and again paints another picture of enduring faith. Then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. See, Jesus recognizes that when we practice a convenient faith, we're trying to maintain two good things. We're trying to hold on to the life, the dreams, the hopes that we had, to, to hold on to those dreams of being significant and powerful, to being a professional athlete, while also holding on to the radical life of surrender of our Savior. And we simply can't balance those two things together throughout all of the struggles and the distractions of our life. And so inevitably, one of them will rise to the top. One of them will become a priority. But more often than not, it's the one that's good for us. It's the one that benefits us. It's the one that's convenient to us. Us. You see, here in this challenge to his disciples, Jesus says that an enduring faith lays down our future at the foot of the cross. That if you want a faith that will go with you, that will navigate the ups and downs of life, that will point glory to God, then you need to lay down your life. Why? So that you can carry mine so that you can place that cross on your shoulder and become a compelling testimony of a kingdom that's greater than the dreams and the hopes, the ambitions and the future that I have. I hope that this series is as challenging as it is encouraging. Because I know it's hard to hear things like we need to lay down our life, we need to surrender our life to take up the cross. But, but I hope that we recognize that in the midst of this, Jesus looks at Peter. Peter has a convenient faith. Peter who has a faith life that's circled around how it benefits him. Peter that becomes central to God's power. He looks at Peter and he says, even on your shoulders, I can build a church that the powers of hell cannot overcome. Why? Because with that cross, I've already claimed the victory. And this is the invitation that we see in the story of Peter. It's an invitation to stop fighting the war and instead claim the victory of Christ. It's an invitation to lay down our hopes, our desires, our judgments, our will and our way and claim his. Because in doing so, our faith becomes enduring. And it will carry us through the highs and lows of life. And it will point the community around us to our Lord and Savior. Would you pray with me?
Heavenly Father, Lord, I admit to you that so often my faith journey has been convenient. I've pursued it because it's beneficial to me. It makes me feel good. It makes me look good. It gives me purpose. It gives me identity. It gives me belonging. Lord, that I have followed you so often for every, every reason other than you. Lord, that I have made myself central to your story. That I've made my experience of your power greater than your power in and of itself. And Lord, in doing so, I admit that I walk through seasons where I am distracted. And I am disengaged. And my faith begins to falter and fall away. So Lord, I pray that we would pursue a faith of, of the unsung disciples. Lord, the subtle faith that sees your power and recognizes your glory, even though we didn't step on the water ourselves. The kind of faith that recognizes your kingdom isn't going to give us the glory and the fame and the significance that we wanted. And yet it's still good. But Lord, I also humbly offer my gratitude that in spite of my shortcomings, in spite of my failings, in spite of my pursuit of convenience, you look at me and many others gathered in this church and say, it's on your shoulders that I will build my church and the powers of hell will not overcome, not because anything you have done, but because the victory has already been won on your cross. I pray this in your name, amen. But
yourself down Raising up the broken to these things and how they affect our lives that God is who he is and that he loves us. He, he knows us better than anyone else knows us and he loves us more than anyone else knows us. Than we can even know, we can even imagine. So we sing these words, even when it's tough, whether we're on the mountaintop or we're in the valley, these are, these are the thoughts. These are, this is who he is. It doesn't change. So let's sing these words together. Mercy has defeated all my 
shame it has And there's no accusation or any condemnation When I look into my father's eyes This is my favorite verse They don't see my sin They only see redemption And this is how my heart has been defined And I can hear a voice that is louder than the thunder Reminding me of who I've always been Yes, I am yours serve a good God. Does anyone agree? So good. He doesn't change. And he knows us. So these words, they hit right to that point. And so if you believe them, even if maybe you don't believe them right now, let's sing them out and see what God might do in our hearts. today was a great reminder for us to examine our own hearts and see what steps we may need to take to fully trust God. And so we have some opportunities that are going to be here on campus that we'd love to tell you about. Our first one coming up is on November 4th. It's going to be led by our very own Phil Anderson called The Critical Journey. It's a full day retreat that's gonna go through the six stages of faith and it'll allow us to examine our own hearts as we learn to fully surrender to God. Another great step that you can take here on campus is our Connect class. 
It's not only a way to learn more about St. Mark's mission and vision, but it's also a way for you to learn how we are designed to be fully engaged in community and in serving. So if you want more information about either of these two experiences or to register for these, you can go online to our uh, register online to smc.church. Another great way to fully step into faith is in giving of our time and our resources. And if you feel led to give to the mission and vision of St. Mark's, there's a QR code on the screens, and there's also a QR code in our Sunday guide. Guys, we hope you have a great rest of your Sunday and an awesome week.